Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vicky Bonner and I'm the Director of Housing at Clarion Housing Group. You were meant to be hearing today from Michelle Reynolds, who's the uh, CEO of uh, Clarion Housing Group. But as so often happens in this brave new world, she has had some technical difficulties. So I am here uh, in her stead. So Clarion Housing Group is the largest social landlord in the country with 125,000 homes nationwide and 350,000 customers who call Clarion their home. I'm delighted to be moderating the webinar today with my colleague, Deb Cartwright, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Oasis Domestic Abuse Services. We both want to say a massive welcome to everybody attending today. Thanks so much. So this event, Domestic Abuse is Everybody's Business, is part of a 16 day sort of uh, 16 days of action to end gender um, based abuse. As I'm sure you're all aware, during the pandemic, there's been a significant increase in incidents of domestic abuse. So this conference comes at a particularly relevant time. The Kent Integrated Domestic Abuse Service, KIDAS as it's known, has got 16 events running between now and the 10th of November, uh, December to inform, educate and inspire action so that we can make domestic abuse everybody's business, which is what you're all helping to do by attending today. During the event, you'll be able to use the chat on your screen to ask questions of our live speakers. That's Jess Phillips MP and Rosie Duffield MP. As the moderator, Deb will ask a selection of questions at the end of both Jess and Rosie's sessions. So please do use the function and um, the chat function to put your questions in so that we can get some great questions to Jess and Rosie. You can use a thumbs up just underneath the question if you really like the question. And, and then and then we'll obviously the more thumbs up, the more quick, the more we'll ask that question. And um, if you'd like to follow up on a question, please preface the question with the words follow up. So then we'll know that it's a follow up. I'm now going to hand over to Deb who will give you an overview of the work that KIDOS does. Thanks, Vicky. Um, KIDOS is the Kent Integrated Domestic Abuse Service, and it represents the three organisations that are commissioned to provide domestic abuse services in Kent. As Vicky said, Clarion are one of those. Look Ahead are another, and Oasis, the organisation that I work for, are the third. Our three organisations operate in different areas across Kent, but our aim is that we bring a baseline provision for those that need our help who are experiencing domestic abuse in both refuge and community settings. We hope this conference is a thought provoking and educational experience for you. We're really happy to be here doing this opening event. And as Vicky said, do sign up for as many of the webinars as you can. Thank you, Deb. So that just leaves me with the wonderful job of introducing Nicole Jacobs, who is the Designate Domestic Abuse Commissioner for England and Wales, and she's recorded a message. Nicole has more than 20 years experience in domestic abuse policy and intervention work and has held a number of senior positions, including Special Projects Director of, at Safe Lives and Senior Operational Manager at, at Refuge. Nicole is going to talk to us about the national picture on domestic abuse and the new domestic abuse bill. Hi, my name is Nicole Jacobs and I'm the Domestic Abuse Commissioner for England and Wales and I'm really pleased um, to be with you to help kick off your 16 days of activism in Kent um, as part of the UN Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women and Girls. And a special thank you to Clarion Group for helping put this together um, and really focus your attention on domestic abuse as everyone's business. Um, I really love that notion um, in terms of thinking about um, what we all need to do, both individually in our organizations and how we can work together um, to address domestic abuse, which is so easy to say. Um, and having worked many, many years in this area, I know it's quite hard to do in many ways. And, um, and so I really applaud the, the level, the, the ambition to raise awareness um, on this issue during these 16 days and to really encourage you um, in all of your partnerships to really think about what can we do better? What can we change? How can we work better together? That's very much uh, the, the notion I bring to the role of the domestic abuse commissioner and the commissioner's office and thinking about um, how we are, at my, my team and I am expected to really 
um, in, in the next year, MAP service provision for domestic abuse for the whole family, for adults and children, um, and also for perpetrators to have programs to, to help change and be held to account um, for their actions. So thinking about the whole, um, the whole family and the whole of the service systems that we need having to sit very much in an environment that's a coordinated response. So the role of housing, health, um, acute mental health trusts, our criminal justice systems, our family justice systems, domestic abuse is one of those issues that there is a thread of activity that must run um, in every in every bit of our services. And very importantly, must be um, must be uh, focused in the community, the very place where we all go um, to seek help and support and advice for anything, our friends, our family, our social networks. So in thinking about what you can do today, I would really like you to um, have a look on websites, particularly that we've developed during COVID and some of the expert um, services have developed to really focus on how friends and family and social networks can really help um, if they're concerned concerned about a, a, a loved one, an employee, a neighbor, a friend. Um, and there's a lot of great resources out there to take. So if there's one thing you could do today, find those resources, share them with others, share them with your colleagues and your, your networks um, so that people have these materials. The other thing that I would encourage you to do is think about getting in touch with your MP um, the, about the domestic abuse bill. It's a bill that we've been talking about for quite a while. It's had a few stops and starts with the election and um, all sorts of other things with um, COVID to some degree. And now we're waiting for a date for it to be um, picked up in the Lords and continue on the parliamentary process. Um, and it's important that our our members of houses of the House of Lords, but also our MPs, where it will ultimately return to the House of Commons, really know your views about the bill and the support that's needed for the bill. Um, I think the bill could be improved. Um, thinking about everyone's business, you know, we should have a statutory duty, not only for refuge, but the whole range of, of community responses um, and, and services in the bill. That's something that is very specific that could change that would really improve the bill. Um, I also believe that we need to um, have provisions in the bill to really adequately respond to migrant women, to women um, or people who have no recourse to public funds and so that they can access services that they need. Um, and there's a range of other amendments that I support, such as a standalone offense for non-fatal strangulation and, and some um, an offense for sharing indecent images. So many of these things um, that we know happen to victims and survivors of abuse that we could address um, more proactively by making them offenses through this domestic abuse bill. You will have your own opinions, I'm sure, but I suppose one of my um, overriding, uh, my overriding encouragement to you as this part of the 16 days of activism is to make one of those days um, talking to people about the domestic abuse bill, getting in touch with MPs and really um, making your views known about that bill. In general, I just want to applaud your efforts, um, efforts in Kent, and really um, endorse the the next sixteen days of of all of the things that you'll do um, to make domestic abuse everyone's business. So many of so much of the time, we really worry about um, the breadth of work we have to do in relation to domestic abuse. We have a long, we've come a long way, but we have a long way to go, and I really understand that. But it's often um, you know, some of the best initiatives are when people get together and just decide in the here and the now, what can we do next? What is something, whether it's within our own um, work environment or in a, a, a multi-agency environment, what can we do right here, right now to take the next steps um, and improve our own practice and improve how we work together? It's as simple as that. There is no easy solution um, to this issue. It is about working together. It is about thinking together and really prioritizing um, the, the, the whole breadth of work that needs to happen in terms of domestic abuse 
piece, but really deciding what do we do um, for our very next step. So this is a great example of that. Thank you again um, for having me. Very good luck with your um, 16 days of activism. And I hope to come to Kent uh, and, and as soon as I possibly can and really see you in person and hear about some of the amazing work you're doing. So thank you and have a good day. Bye-bye. So thank you so much to Nicole. And, and now to get the Kent perspective, we're joined by Claire Bell, Kent County Council Cabinet Member for Adult Social Care and Public Health. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Kent Integrated Domestic Abuse Service Conference on behalf of Kent County Council. I wish to thank the KEDAS providers, Clarion, Look Ahead, Oasis and Victim Support for inviting me to speak and for their hard work to pull together a diverse and stimulating timetable of events in this virtual conference, the first of its kind in Kent. I am delighted that so many have signed up to join us to support the 16 days of action, and I'm sure everyone will come away with some truly tangible actions and learning that they can implement in their working and everyday lives. The Domestic Abuse Bill will give us in Kent a firm and stable platform to build on the significant progress we have made here towards tackling domestic abuse. It encourages local authorities like KCC to work in partnership to tackle domestic abuse and provides the statutory grounding to continue to push the domestic abuse agenda forward. I am delighted to support this work, which raises both the profile of domestic abuse and improves service delivery for survivors. Crucially, the bill includes a clear statutory definition of what we mean by abuse and importantly affords children who witness abuse the recognition of survivors in their own right. Within Kent we are now in a good position to take this agenda forward having been on a significant journey to get us to where we are today. Just four years ago services here were planned and arranged in isolation. Service provision varied according to where you live and didn't always join up. For victims and survivors of domestic abuse, this meant services were hard to navigate and there were gaps between them. Determined to address this, the Council collaborated with partners to bring budgets together from adult social care, public health, the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner, who I believe will be talking at the conference later, uh, Kent Fire and Rescue and District and Borough Councils to jointly plan and design a joined up integrated service that put the individual at its heart. Together as partners with a shared endeavour, we created the Kent Integrated Domestic Abuse Service or KIDAS. Together we now have a countywide referral and triage service to ensure that there is no wrong door for survivors. We found a way to make sure that whilst we never lose focus on those at highest risk, we have been able to increase our focus on prevention and early intervention. Critically, we've designed a service that can wrap around the individual and flex as their needs change. This determination and commitment to working together has meant that at a time when other areas have had to disinvest, in Kent we have not only retained our good levels of service provision, but have expanded, opening a brand new refuge in Tunbridge in 2018. Together we have made much progress in the last four years, but much remains to be done and we will continue to strive to provide the best and most effective services. The Domestic Abuse Bill provides the perfect opportunity to address and push forward this progress. Along with our key partners, we have worked hard to continue to nurture our partnership work and develop robust decision making processes. We have come together to create and commit to the Kent and Medway Domestic Abuse Strategy, launched in March this year. The action plan to support this strategy includes several cross-partnership improvement projects, with all partners striving to deliver to a common aim, which is to reduce the prevalence of domestic abuse and ensure that where domestic abuse takes place, all those affected get the right support quickly. Never have these services been more challenged than in the COVID-19 pandemic. And I would like to take this opportunity to commend all providers as they have risen to this complex challenge. We also recognise that during these times of social distancing, 
domestic abuse services have been under extraordinary pressure. Highlight how well our providers have risen to this challenge under exceptional circumstances and celebrate the fruits of their labours. Against a backdrop of national concerns around increasing levels of domestic abuse, providers here in Kent came together as a team to deliver creative and collaborative offers for residents in and across the county. They worked hard to build and win bids for national government COVID funding. They successfully brought new money into Kent to develop new digital and technological options to keep survivors supported and connected throughout lockdown. They created virtual support and successful groundbreaking delivery of therapeutic programmes online. Working together, providers widen their reach, developing a bite-sized training video for staff in community settings such as supermarkets, pharmacies and community volunteers, equipping them with the tools they need so that no opportunity would be missed to support those experiencing abuse. Through delivering services and supporting each other through the pandemic, the KIDAS partnership has flourished. This first ever countywide virtual conference devised, designed and led by four separate providers is a perfect example of what can be achieved when we build strong partnerships. Kent is a large complex county, but by working together, we can make sure that support is there when needed for those surviving the devastating crime of domestic abuse. Again, I would like to thank you for your participation. I sincerely hope you will enjoy the events over the next 16 days and continue to support us in raising awareness of such a serious issue. Well, thank you so much to Claire Bell for that video there about the work that Kaidas are doing. Um, and I should apologise actually, because I should have said four providers, victim support as well, providing the triage service for our organisations. And it's a really valuable point that she makes that we are have been working really collaboratively with the aim that there is not a postcode lottery around those fundamental services for those who are at risk of harm. It's also been really lovely to hear Nicole Jacobs speak about the DA bill and what it means for those that are experiencing the issue nationally. And I think that sometimes we can feel on the front line or on the ground quite detached from those sorts of issues like bills going through Parliament. But it's incredibly important that we do engage with those. Unfortunately, we have just had um, we're having some issues with Jess Phillip Phillips coming online. So we're going to invite Rosie Duffield MP to speak to us first. Rosie is the Member of Parliament for Canterbury, Whitstable and the Villages. Before being elected as an MP, she was a primary school teaching assistant. So she really knows the work that we do from that educational perspective. She was also kept very busy raising two boys and was an active local campaigner for many years. She's chair of the Women's Parliamentary Labour Party and has led for calls for stronger domestic violence le legislation, including speaking out very movingly in Parliament about her own experiences. If she wasn't an MP, she says she'll be right, she'd be writing satirical comedy sketches, probably about politics and geocaching at the weekends. But we know that she would continue to campaign on a grass, grassroots level on issues affecting women worldwide. Welcome, Rosie, and thank you. Thank you very much, Deb. Sorry, my voice is a little bit um, rough today, but I'll try my best. A year ago, I stood in the House of Commons and spoke about domestic abuse. As one of only 552 women ever to have been elected to the House of Commons, speaking about domestic abuse, abuse or issues that affect mostly women is par for the course. 52% of the population have every right to expect those of us who've managed to smash that glass ceiling to speak up for them, to voice our collective concerns, to tell of our struggles, our history, battles, victories, frustrations, injustices, joy and pain. In the context of the history of Parliament, women telling our stories is still so new that we have the opportunity to pack a punch, strike a blow, or to use less violence references, we still have the chance to make a difference, grab the headlines, 
really get noticed and be heard. That saying or expression, there's nothing new under the sun, really doesn't apply when it comes to women in Parliament. There is. We are. We've only just got started. We're still breaking rules, smashing taboos, broaching subjects that ne are never mentioned and have never been mentioned before in that place. And you can feel it. You can feel that when you open your mouth. The words come tumbling out shyly into the chamber, like delicate, fragile, newborn lambs that haven't even tried to stand up yet, or those blowing bubbles that might pop at any second. Not because we are fragile or delicate creatures, we're anything but, but you can feel the newness, the unfamiliarity of things not said many times before and words not even heard in a place which has so long been occupied by the same types of people who haven't really thought to speak of issues that mostly affect the half of the population who just haven't even been present there at all until relatively recently. So in June 2018, when a young woman called Danielle Rowley, the former MP for Midlothian, announced to the chamber that she was late because she had her period, this became headline news. The first time any MP had ever done something like that. At the time, there were just 209 women in the House of Commons, less than a third of all the MPs there. And in October last year, when I spoke about my own experience of an abusive relationship, I probably shouldn't have been quite so shocked at the impact it seemed to make. I asked Speaker Burko if he would bend the usual protocols slightly and allow me to speak early on in the debate. I know I couldn't have sat there for hours listening to speech after speech about violence and abuse. And I knew that I wouldn't have the courage to speak at all if I had the chance to sit there going over it all in my head and talking myself out of it. And isn't that exactly what women do every single day behind closed doors the world over? We tell ourselves not to speak up, not to raise our voices, not to tell our truth, to say that we're okay and to not ask for help. So I know that I had no choice. I had to stand up and channel the pain and anguish I felt for other women in those few minutes. I had to be a voice for those women behind closed doors. We're so fortunate in this country to have so many charities and NGOs, some of whom are represented here today, dedicated to looking after people who need support and shelter, who offer understanding, a safe space and a new start. When I received thousands of emails from people who'd experienced abusive relationships, my team and I really needed those organisations and they really stepped up for us. They talked to us about what we were reading in emails, about where to signpost all those who wrote needing our help. My local refuge charity, Rising Sun, were and are just phenomenal. There are thousands of unsung heroes who deal with this day in and day out. I know that all of the women I speak to, speak to in my MP surgeries stay with me. Their stories are lodged somewhere. They turn to us in their most desperate time of need. They feel they have nowhere else to go and we try to pick them up, put them on a path to freedom, confidence, less fear. But I'm really conscious of stressing over and over that we MPs are not experts. So many people who wrote in wanted advice, counselling or guidance. We had emails from all around the world from people who had somehow seen or heard that a British MP had talked about domestic abuse. And I lay awake at night reading through them and just sobbing. One young man wrote to me about having grown up in a house where his, his mother was kept as a virtual prisoner. Her emails, texts, phone calls were tracked and monitored, her bank account controlled by her partner and the verbal and sometimes physical abuse that kept the family on eggshells constantly. I immediately felt ashamed, angry and guilty as a mother, understanding straight away how horrific that must have been for any child in that situation, feeling helpless, seeing her pain and knowing there was nothing they could really do to help. That young man has, was racked with guilt. He wished he'd known what to do, but he was only a child. I can't imagine what David Challen and other children in those situations must have gone through. He is, of course, the son of Sally Challen and must have witnessed much the same as some of those who wrote to me. David is now an incredible champion in the fight against domestic abuse. Although I must just say, 
I hate the words we use about this, so often violence-based expressions like fight, war or battle. Let's just try to erase domestic abuse and violence, minimise it, make it rare, unusual, make it stand out as totally socially unacceptable. Another great champion, of course, is my wonderful colleague and friend, Jess Phillips. We need another word for brave and gutsy when it comes to Jess. She's never ever shied away from the difficult conversations, from breaking taboos. She crashed into parliament in a way that nobody could possibly miss and has never wanted, she's never wasted a single day of her time as an MP. Jess is someone who can never be accused of just talking the talk. With a background of working in the domestic abuse sector, she talks and others listen. The government even listens and she brings about real and meaningful change like in the domestic violence bill that's going through at the moment. Of course, of course though, there is a price to pay. Us ceiling smashing women have rattled more than a few cages in the short time that we've been allowed to roam free along those historic corridors. The many aggressive written words of virtual slaps across the face paraded on social media from men who are raging. They feel cross, uncomfortable and free to tell the world that by using nasty sex-based phrases they're going to try and put us back in our place. But women like me have survived so much worse. Come at me from the safety of your sofa. Type your nasty, unoriginal slurs. Women like me have faced down far worse and it makes us fearless. We've survived situations which more than once we didn't think we would. We've mentally rehearsed what the end would really feel and look like when it came. That one violent, final violent act that burns in the eyes of a person who makes it clear he could snuff you out like a candle, land a fatal blow or snap you like a twig. That person who swears he loves you but hurts you over and over again. Was the thing you escaped from that made you stronger? Oops, sorry, I think I got lost there for a minute. That was the thing you escaped from that made you stronger and made you feel determined to live a new, full and happy life. We're not victims and we deserve to call ourselves survivors. And those of us who have survived will never forget those who did not. Nor will we ever stop working towards a day when there are no more victims, just strong, confident, happy survivors like us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosie. Um, you are gifted with very moving speaking, I must say. We're really honoured to have you speak on that subject. Thank you. I think you made a really, really important point, actually, when you said about the speech you gave in the Commons last year and that you had to ask to go earlier because you might have talked yourself out of it. That's a real issue, isn't it, for people who are experiencing abuse and yeah. violence? Do you, um, what would you say to them? I think um, on average, I would imagine, just, just anecdotally in my own life and people I know, in order to sort of just make the first step, you have to rehearse it over and over and over again in your head. So I mentioned in my speech in Parliament that I had imagined um, how that would look, what I would do, how I would sort of get out, but I knew that that wasn't the answer for me. I needed my ex-partner to leave. Um, it was my flat and I wanted somehow to get him out. And I tried it a few times. A couple of times he bashed the door down when I had the chain on. Um, and, you know, I, had, I then had the sort of embarrassing situation of having to get someone around to repair that. And I thought, OK, I can't do that again. So I, I sort of listened to his routine in the morning and hid his keys. And I, I planned it for weeks on end, mm -hmm. just, you know, as his nastiness got worse and worse. And as I was kind of planning it, I also kept talking myself out of it. If he if he did anything that was vaguely not awful, so if he kind of put the kettle on even or um, didn't sort of growl at me when I walked through the door, I kind of told myself, don't be silly, it's okay. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to just really encourage women to kind of do things at their own pace and not necessarily to just sort of go. It's really the most dangerous thing when you just up and leave. We, we kind of know that statistically. Um, 
And even when I spoke out, the thing I was most scared of was my ex-partner. So I did one interview in a newspaper and I said, if you mention his name, if, if he thinks that he's not anonymous, I'm as good as dead because all he's got is, is his reputation, his anonymity. And journalists did stick to that, even though it didn't take a lot of searching on the internet to kind of find the name of the person. Um, but yeah, I think it is just encouraging women and, and telling them that you'll be there for them. And if you think, even if you think you've got it all lined up and there's an easy route and then they sort of back off and get frightened, don't lose patience with them. Give them another chance and just let them do it at their own pace, I think. Thank you. And what would you say to someone who said to you, why didn't you just leave? Um, I think it's fear. I think I knew that if I just ran away, I wouldn't have anywhere to go. Um, and he would just find me. Um, I wouldn't have organised a safe space. Um, and, you know, like I said, when you do do that, that's when you are pursued. Um, not long after I left, there was a story in the newspaper in the gossip columns about me dating someone else. And again, that terror came back to me because he would have taken that as a slight, as a sort of um, mark against his manhood, if you like. Mm -hmm. And I knew that, again, I was, I was in danger. Um, so you have to make sure that you're safe. You, you really have to do that. So, so people saying, why can't you just leave? Women know. You, you just instinctively feel whether you're safe or not. And it isn't safe to just run because they'll chase you a lot of the time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Andy Lingwood in the chat says all plans are good plans. And Susanna Gilbert um, thanks you for sharing and asks, how did you find that your MP colleagues treated you afterwards, after your disclosure? It was amazing. Um, I really didn't want to become a headline. I thought it was really important to speak for sort of every woman, if you like. And I thought I'll speak. And then Yvette Cooper and Harriet Harman and Jess and people that are sort of much more famous than me would speak and get all the headlines. So I thought, OK, I'll do my bit, then I'll kind of run away. But my colleagues were incredible. And I sat in the tea room just sort of calming down. And they were saying, oh, God, social media. And I went, don't tell me. I don't want to see any horrible comments. But it was just really supportive and overwhelming. And they were just amazing and really kind and kept checking in on me and still do, actually. Yeah. Good. I'm glad to hear it. And I think it's so brave and it's so important that we are able to say, and actually you've done a thing that so many people can't because we, you know, we have so many service users that can't come out and speak publicly because of the lack of safety and the fear. Yeah. And you yourself had that lack of safety and that fear. Um, it's really inspirational. People are calling you inspirational on the chat, saying how moving this is. Thank you. Um, and also saying that MPs, uh, one person in particular says their MP was fantastic um, after their ex for, around their experiences. And I think that's also really important. That's what this conference is about, isn't it? It's about whoever you approach, um, let's make it that they can answer what you what you need. And Definitely. But worth also saying that if you do approach someone and they're not supportive and not helpful, that's their problem. They're, they're unusual. I think try again, try with someone else. Even if the first thing you do is just maybe a friend will probably pick it up. Just stop denying things. I think that's probably the reality. Um, so other people had noticed what was going on with me and I spent so long and worked so hard at denying it and putting on a brave face. I think the first time you just stop doing that is a massive step actually. Just stop telling everyone they're wrong. And it will feel really strange at first, but then it becomes a bit more easy and you realise they noticed it. They're telling the truth. You're not imagining it. You're not um, exaggerating. And yeah. other people have noticed. So it sort of validates your own feelings. It shouldn't, but it does. So it just stop lying, I think, is, is a good first step. Absolutely. And that hooks us right back to don't, you know, try not to talk yourself out of trying again. Yeah it can feel bad when someone doesn't give us the response that we want or need yeah. but actually make that about them and try someone else definitely. absolutely rosie thank you so much we're really honored to have had you share thank you thank you so much for inviting me and good luck with the rest of the 16 days thank you thanks That's wonderful. That is very moving, actually, to hear Rosie speak in that way. And as she said, we're also going to hear from Jess Phillips, 
<clears throat> excuse me, Jess is the Shadow Minister for Domestic Violence and Safeguarding. She became MP for Yardley in Birmingham at, at the 2015 general election. And she was committed before that to helping improve the lives of others. She had worked for Women's Aid in West Midlands, developing services for victims of domestic abuse, sexual violence, human trafficking and exploitation and became a counsellor in 2012. She was Birmingham's first ever victims champion. Jess has continued fighting for those who need support most um, and has earned a reputation for plain speaking since being elected, unfazed by threats and calling out sexist attitudes as she promotes women's rights. We're very lucky to have Jess as well today opening the conference and I'd like to welcome her now. Hi Jess. Hi there, can you hear me? I just want to check that first. Yeah, you yeah. can. Um, brilliant. Um, first of all, it's a total pleasure to follow Rosie, who is not just my colleague, but also my friend. Um, and she has absolutely made waves in um, in the field of domestic abuse in a way that only personal testimony can do, especially from somebody who is perceived to have power, wealth um, and status to try and send the message that uh, it's not just everybody's business to deal with um, domestic abuse when they come across it, but also that it, the reality is, is that it can happen to anybody. Um, um, and for far too long, it, um, it and still today, it, is, it can be presented as if domestic abuse is something that happens to welfare dependent women or um, to those in a lower socioeconomic class. And uh, Rosie's testimony certainly put paid to a huge amount of that, which was um, very, very welcome and very vital for people to hear. Um, so talking about uh, domestic abuse being everybody's business, um, I think that I would start my remarks by saying that I, um, when I was the victim's champion for Birmingham, as it has already been um, said, I sort of bowled in there um, full of demands and uh, on how Birmingham City Council, the biggest council in Europe, should be managing at every single level. Uh, domestic abuse, that no matter who you were, if you worked in the council, that you had a responsibility, if, not just if someone came forward to you, but to, to make it so that people felt that they could come forward to you. Um, and I remember in one training that I was running with some staff who were part of a, who were frontline workers in a local advice um, housing centre. Um, and this one woman said to me in that meeting, but it's not, it's not my job. Domestic violence isn't in my job title. It's, I've got nothing to do with this. To which response I said to her, if your sister were to knock on your door tonight and say to you, oh, you know, I, I'm not happy at home. I'm being controlled. My husband's being violent towards me. Would you say, well, I'm, I'm just really sorry, but domestic abuse is not in my job title um, as your sister. That's for like, you know, Christmas dinner and buying your kids a present at Christmas. It's not my job title to care about domestic abuse. And uh, the reality is, is that it is, it is and should be part of anybody who works with people should be trained and able to deal with people coming forward but also how to allow people to come forward um, i'm afraid to say that uh, i then went on to uh, insist on various questions being asked of people in certain categories so if somebody was coming in for a homelessness interview or if somebody was coming in uh, to talk about welfare benefits at, at any sites that birmingham city council um, had people facing services i put questions onto a questionnaire where um, i made people ask the question about whether things were okay at home 
And um, I remember sitting in one of the housing offices when I was a councillor, I'd gone with a constituent and in the next booth next to me in a completely unprivate space with like a slight board in between me and the people sat next to me. I, I watched uh, how that played out because the, the housing officer in front of me, like on a computer said, oh, you know, have, are you a, have you ever been a victim of domestic abuse? And the woman in front of her said, yes. Said, have you ever been a victim of sexual violence? And the woman said, yes. And uh, then she moved on to the next set of questions, never responding to like a human being or seeking to find out more or help. And I realised that actually the strategy is not just to make sure that people are asking the right questions, that the only way that we're going to actually train people to deal with this is, is to make as many people as possible a know that there has to be somewhere to send these people once you have found them there's got to be somewhere some resource some service that can be allocated to this person and not just a phone number but an actual service for people but also i had to try and make people deeply care about it as if it was happening on every street it could possibly be happening to their neighbours, their sisters, their family members. And that is a much harder task, although I have to say, I do think that that task has been made considerably better um, by the pandemic. There is has been a universal um, sense that people understand a, a few things that they maybe didn't understand before. For the first time ever, people understand what it might be like to be petrified in their own home, to be locked up in their own home, to feel that they don't have control over their life and their decisions in a way that they would have before. And what I found from lots of conversations I've had with people over this period is that, that for the first time they realise what it what it would be like and how much worse it would be if when you were locked up in your home, you were locked up with somebody who was abusing you. The second part of the task is considerably harder. And for many, many, many policymakers and politicians, the thing that we do is we stand on platforms and it happened all the time during the pandemic where ministers would stand at the dispatch box or on platforms in front of the entire viewing nation of the, of, uh, the weird briefings and say, we want you to come forward. You are not alone. And you are not alone has to actually mean that you are not alone. It can't just be a tagline in a government campaign. It has to mean when you tell someone to come forward, that when they do come forward, that that coming forward isn't just another disappointment. It isn't just another pushing you to a box where somebody is essentially gonna say, I'm sorry, you don't meet the threshold for safeguarding in this regard because that is what happens in our country at the moment, is that if you are to come forward, even have police interaction with regard to your domestic abuse, that they can, they're, they're meant to, the intention is that they're meant to refer you to an IDVA service, um, an independent domestic violence advice service, or some form of support service. However, in most parts of the country, and certainly the one that I represent, unless the threshold that you can meet is of the highest risk of harm, you are essentially about to be murdered, then it's very, very unlikely that you are going to get an end-to-end -end service that could potentially support you out of risk harm. Um, and that cannot continue to be the case. We can no longer ration services based on um, a series of, of risk assessments that do not allow for the fact that risk in domestic abuse, as Rosie so rightly put it, it is dynamic. It is not something that just happens and stays the same until it drops off. It goes up and down and it depends on other things that are going on in your life, the life of your perpetrator, the life of your children. And until we can offer a genuine service, then to, to all people who come forward, 
then we we have got to be really really careful at telling people that there will be something there if they do come forward 60 percent of the women who came forward for refuge accommodation last year in the united kingdom well in england and wales were turned away from a, a specialist refuge bed if this were the same in services for diabetic people we would be aghast as a nation the idea that we would only offer the treatment for um, hypoglycemic shock to just somebody when they were in shock rather than offering insulin to them as part of a prevention strategy would be horrifying the idea then that we would only offer diabetes medication to every fourth person who came forward to receive it would be an absolute national scandal and however that is the way that domestic abuse victims are often treated in our country Th this will not change unless it is core to every people-based service whether that is the nhs whether that is education whether that is housing welfare police courts until it is a fundamental part to recognize to seek um disclosure and to know how to handle disclosure in every single service we will continue to have stubbornly high statistics of, of women murdered each year. Today, the femicide census of the past 10 years shows that 100, what, 1,425 women were murdered by men in the space of a 10 year period. And we cannot just keep accepting that this statistic remains so stubbornly high. The government are doing quite a lot to um, legislate for this and the domestic abuse bill that that uh, rosie has alluded to um will although it's taken um the entire time i've been in parliament it's been going through parliament and still uh, we won't see, the end of this year will not see it through its next stage of the process it's currently waiting to be heard in the house of lords the domestic abuse bill has some really great parts to it that will have real potential to improve services on the ground however the reality is is that we cannot just legislate our way out of violence against women and girls and domestic abuse the fact of the matter is is already illegal to rape it is already illegal to murder the 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 legislation in and of itself does not change social structures and social behaviors if we continue to fail to properly legislate and to create structures in our society that recognize the gendered nature of domestic abuse we will continue to fail the 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 simple fact is is that it's our economic policy in this country that means that women have less financial um independence that women's health is considerably less well catered for that women are have a lesser place in society is the fundamental reason that women fall prey to power of uh, the power of power and control models such as domestic abuse domestic abuse is the byproduct of the fact that women can be controlled because of their position in society and we all have a responsibility to challenge that where we see it to challenge the pervading idea that women are somehow responsible for the violence that befalls them that women are somehow less likely to be paid more because they didn't ask for a pay rise it's simply not borne out in any of the data that women are paid less because they didn't ask for a pay rise in fact in Aust i think it's australia the only place in the in the world where they actually monitor requests they uh, keep a data monitor of requests for pay rises women asked as much as men and the pay gap continues in australia just as much as it does anywhere else in the world 
until we have proper direct action in every government department across every part of our legislature that tries to tackle the epidemic pandemic even of domestic abuse we will continue to fail in this regard there is so much that everybody can be doing that everybody can take a part in trying to solve this issue and i think that some of what rosie was saying about the need to give people space to come forward is vitally important what i will always try and ask people to say well what can i do what, what exactly can i do about this and lots of people will that will manifest in them seeking to um give donations to local refugees, give financial donations to charities uh, in this area, which is all absolutely vital and brilliant. But what we can all be doing in our own lives is making ourselves available for the people around us to come forward if they felt able to. Um, I, I get very, very, very annoyed with the idea that it's hard to get people to disclose. We call them hard to reach. Um, and it has never been my experience that people were hard to reach because I have made myself available for them to reach me should they need to. I will be stood in a um, supermarket. I was once at one of those very annoying self checkouts um, and a woman came up to me and she said, oh, you're Jess Phillips, aren't you? Um, and told me about how she had been living with abuse for many, many years. Um, another time at a children's party that I was at, a mother I didn't know told me that that week she had been raped. Whilst at a children's party, people feel that they can come forward when you make it clear that you will listen, that you will have something, something to say, somewhere to uh to to send them or to help them or that you will just believe them and that is something that every single person whether it's your local housing officer in birmingham city council whether it's the bin men who notice something whether it is anyone in society the simple asking of the question is everything okay is all it usually takes for people to actually be given the permission to tell you their reality. I think uh, I'm going to stop talking. Deb has just appeared. Uh, and I think you're going to ask me some questions, which I'm meant to look for somewhere. <laughs> there we go. I am. Um, I didn't mean to stop you. No, 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 no. It's totally fine. You can stop me. I'll just go on forever if you don't. <laughs> I do love the idea of um, our level playing field, meaning that MPs bowl into places nowadays. That makes me feel good, I must say. Um, and I love the way you challenge the idea of <laughs> I often wear um, I like the way you challenge the concept of hard to reach as well because actually we talk a lot about the, if somebody can't get access to us it's because we're making ourselves hard to access and I think that's a really important message um, how do we become more accessible so Rachel Westlake I'm pleased to say that we do have a um, better landscape than you described here in Kent because we do have a um, baseline of services that are comprehensive and should help someone from early intervention right up to high risk prevention. Rachel asks, she's our commissioner by the way, she asks, are there any amendments that you would like to see within the DA bill? Uh, can you hear me? Because it's telling me my microphone isn't working. Yeah, can hear you. Yeah, you can hear me fine. Um, it's wrong. The machines are lying to us. Um, the, uh, the well, I put in forty-seven amendments at committee stage to the domestic abuse bill. I sometimes think that I, you know, would like to have just look, <laughs> delete all after the word domestic abuse bill and then just write it again. Um, but because it's been going through for so long. Uh, a huge amount of work has gone into the process of getting it right even before it went to committee. When the domestic abuse bill was first muted and it, we had it in draft form, um, it was basically uh, putting the definition of domestic abuse in all its forms into law, uh, stopping perpetrators cross-examining their witnesses in the family courts and uh, putting in a, a commissioner 
and doing a um and having a new sort of order now that is not enough that will change almost nothing and what i kept saying to the minister was that in my time in refuge you know the women in refuge they asked for nothing else than the de definition of domestic abuse to be written down into law i mean literally no one once ever said that to me they said i need a house and i need a school place for my kid and i'd like to have some psychological therapy for my kids they very rarely asked for it themselves they often wanted it for their kids um, they just wanted to just, you know, move on with their lives. They d certainly were not like, well, what we really need is a better defined set of rules. Um, but um, we worked for a very long time to amend it so that it has much more special measures in the family courts. Um, the, we're working on the presumption of contact of violent uh, fathers. Currently, that's under review. Um, we are seeking, uh, we, we managed to win the idea that refuge would be, have a statutory footing, so it would be as important um, it, to local councils to fund it as it is to fund the bin service. So women got to matter as much as bins. Um, and so there's quite a lot more in it now than was in it before, but it's still so much farther to go till it will actually demonstratively change the lives of people on the ground. Um, for a start, off, unless it seeks to protect community-based services in the same way it's, it's sought to protect, protect refuge-based services, politicians understand bricks, they understand roofs and buildings, they like to stand in front of them and have their photos taken. They're much, much less au okay fait with uh, revenue-based services rather than capital services. They they don't understand the people element. Um, and a, a refuge is literally nothing without its people. And it's the same for community-based services. So actually, only a third of women ever end up in refuge. So 70% of uh, victims of domestic abuse are currently not served by that particular law and until it serves them all. But the single thing that I would seek to change, if I could only change one thing in the domestic abuse bill, I would make it so that the government accepted that all victims of domestic abuse in our country uh, it should be entitled to refuge accommodation and community-based services regardless of which country they were born in and I would take away the no recourse to public funds element that means that still hundreds and hundreds of women in our country get turned away just by virtue of where they were born. Thank you, Jess. And we had a question about the how does the gender pay gap work? Um, I thought it would be covered by discrimination laws, but for me, I'm going to bring that out more widely into the fact that you did actually say that we do have, you know, it is illegal to kill someone, it is illegal to rape someone, it is illegal to harass someone. So actually, what would you say to that idea that how do we actually get these things implemented once they're out there in statute? I mean, the, the reality is, is that uh, once things are out there in statute, um, that, you know, you, you one of the ways we do it, actually, and the gender pay gap is a really good example of how this has been done, is we t you have to take legal action, which is really, really hard for an individual, much less hard for a group of organisations. And so um, I was part of two different uh, judicial reviews uh, into the law with regards to domestic abuse. One was around uh, people saying that you had to have a local connection to stay in a local refuge that had been funded by the council, which obviously completely breaks down the entire refuge movement because people have to be able to move across like people where I live I mean I don't know what it's like down uh, south but you know where I live everybody thinks they live in the same place but it's actually seven different local authorities so the idea that they're like oh I've crossed some invisible line on the border but now I don't have a local connection so we we, we strength tested that in court using equality law and that we won on that case so that that got taken away. Also, um, the use uh, of the bedroom tax to charge uh, victims of domestic violence who had had um, panic rooms put into their uh, houses. Uh, we managed to win that case in court as well. So um, one of the ways is you have to test the law. When you make legislation, you actually have to test it and equal pay and things. That's constantly being tested. The gender pay gap is constantly being tested in our in our country's courts. Um, but the, the, the only way to really make sure that legislation actually is more than words written on goatskin in the cellar of the House of Commons is is to make sure that your representatives care about enacting it and when they don't don't vote for them. <laughs> yeah fair dues thank you for answering that so uh, Melanie Woods asks what is the process for the DA bill from here to implementation? 
Um, well, it's currently waiting its second reading in the Lords and then it will go to committee stage of the Lords, which there's a real opportunity for lots more amendments to go in. And I expect it to be amended quite a lot. Then it will come back to the Commons um, and then go through a final process in the Commons. Um, but it's actual implementation on the ground. Some of it has started. So I know that you've, you're going to hear or you have already have heard from Nicole uh, Jacobs, who is the commissioner, that, that, that there's no reason to wait for the law to pass for that, that position to be in existence. Some of her powers rely on the bill that she currently doesn't have. Um, but um, and the implementation of the legal duty on local authorities is already being worked through with local authorities. Um, so some of that implementation on the ground will start to happen. I, I, I very, very much doubt that it will be in any time soon that we see a massive improvement in the way that domestic violence victims are treated by various systems um, or that we see a decline in domestic abuse or an increase in charging and um, conviction uh, and a decrease in murder anytime soon. Don't, you know, to expect that piece of legislation to do any of those things without proper targets on ministers in their own departments, regardless of which department it is, uh, I don't expect us to be seeing any less anytime soon. Okay, thank you. One final question. Is enough done with young... Oh, it's disappeared. There it is. Is enough done with young men, particularly those who witness abuse, to ensure they understand that it's wrong? And at what age do you think that should start? I mean, n n not enough is done with children, full stop. Um, children who have lived with domestic abuse. One of the things, one of the successes we had on the Domestic Abuse Bill Committee was that we got into the definition that children who live with domestic abuse should be considered to be victims of it. Mm -hmm. uh, whether they are direct victims themselves of any violence or control, they are fundamentally controlled by their living environment. Um, and and that's, so that's not even in the law at the moment. They're not even considered to be victims of uh, domestic abuse. What needs to be done is um, we, we absolutely need much more support for children living with domestic abuse to stop them um, from uh, copying any of those patterns of behaviour, either as victims or perpetrators, without question. And it is the single biggest priority of any victim of domestic violence is that their child would have some access to some form of service. And frankly, across the country, that is patchy at best. And it certainly is not reaching all of the children living in that circumstance. So nowhere near enough is done. It is now on the legislative books, although slightly held up by COVID, that all children from the age of four to 16 or maybe even 18, um, that it's compulsory for them to have um, healthy sex and relationship education. Uh, and that should very much be formed in part of the idea of safeguarding them um, as adults in the future. But we time will tell, because if teachers are going to be expected to live with that rather than specialists, yeah. you can bet your bottom dollar that, that they've got a million other things on and how successful that will be will, will all be in the delivery. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Just one final question I'm going to slip in um, because it's a really good one, David Naylor. Do you feel that there is a structure for all staff of the Houses Parliament experiencing DA to disclose should they need to? No. No. The structure is me. <laughs> um and uh i mean there are structures where you can go and you can get counseling and and services and you know actually as a working environment it's a place that talks about domestic abuse more than most to be fair um but i, I very much doubt it's coming up in the day-to-day -day running of asda um but um so you know there's one thing where it is a thing that gets talked about but my gosh, no, the, 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 tr the trouble with the structures in Parliament is because of the structures in politics that fall on party political lines. Mm. Um, and so if you, you, you know, there, there's lots and lots of issues about the kind of people. And I'll be completely honest that if you were being abused by somebody else who was part of a political scene, you have almost no chance of the systems being in place for you. And that is something that myself and others, cross-party, uh, Andrea Leadsom, uh, Maria Miller, um, 
and uh, others as well, Laura Farris, we have been really trying to improve and there have been some improvements, but really, no, is the answer. Okay. Thank you, Jess. I'm very honoured to have moderated your speech to us today. Thank you for your time. Um, and I'm sorry that we couldn't get to everyone's questions as well, but I'm going to hand back to Vicky now and say a big thank you from all of us, Jess, for being with us, and also to Rosie and back to Vicky for our final thoughts. So I'd, I'd echo what Deb said. Thanks so much uh, for attending, Jess, Rosie and Nicole, but also thanks to everybody who's attended today, and in particular, of those who've asked such fantastic um because i think they've really added to the conversation today a recording of the webinar will be made available to you shortly so thanks so much for attending and um, there are so many other events taking place um over the course of the next 16 days and there's still time to register on your conference journey so it doesn't need to end here so please go to www.daeverybodysbusiness.org and the events will run until the 10th of december you can also keep the conversation going with the hashtag dae everybody Everybody's business and to hashtag uh, no see speak out. So if the talk today has raised anything with you personally and you'd like to find out more about the services available, please go to to www.domesticabuseservices.org.uk where you can find out more about how to refer into your local service. So thanks so much to you all for attending. Bye bye.